Welcome back. Now, Michel Barnier appears to have little sympathy for the plight of UK Prime Minister Theresa May. Europe's chief Brexit negotiator says British politicians need to take responsibility for their actions. His comments come as British MPs debate UK Prime Minister Theresa May's hard-fought deal, a decision Barnier calls, quote, lose-lose and an exercise in damage control. MPs are set to vote on Tuesday, but there is now speculation about whether that vote will be delayed to avoid a large and potentially devastating defeat for May. And here's what what Michel Barnier had to say at the European Parliament today. Ce moment est grave pour l'Europe. Ce n'est surtout pas et certainement pas le moment d'une quelconque célébration, puisque, permettez-moi de le dire comme négociateur de l'Union européenne, cette négociation est négative. C'est une négociation négative. Le Brexit n'a aucune valeur ajoutée. C'est lose-lose. Et donc il s'agissait dans cette négociation, il s'agit encore de limiter les conséquences. Well, our political editor Darren McCaffrey is just outside Westminster tonight. Darren, good to see you there in London. Okay, so there's a lot of talk about what is going to happen next, uh, that May's deal is not going to get through. We heard Barnier there saying, you know, it seems like there is no appetite to renegotiate. We don't know whether, you know, uh, May's deal is going to get through or that vote is going to be delayed. So how will all of this affect what's happening on that side, Darren? Well, it's interesting listening to Michel Barnier there reiterating the Europeans' line that this is the only deal, the best deal, uh, and that people should back it. Of course, that plays into Theresa May's hands. They are trying to give her some political support uh, from uh, Brussels. She uh, reminding everyone uh, yet again today uh, that this really was the only deal on the table as far as the European Union were uh, concerned. Uh, Philip Hammond, who's the Chancellor here in the UK, stood up in Parliament earlier on, Tessa, uh, saying that people were dis delusioned. Uh, if they thought that somehow there would be re, uh, a renegotiated uh, deal. Uh, however, it must be said that most MPs think, well, Brussels would say that, wouldn't they? Theresa May would say that, wouldn't uh, she? For the Labour Party, they believe that they can renegotiate a softer form of Brexit. And for those Brexiteers, they think that a Conservative leader, whether it be Theresa May or not, can go back and get rid of this most hated uh, backstop. Whether the vote goes ahead on Tuesday, well, Tessa, when you look at the arithmetic, it's really, really uh, difficult. Uh, upwards of 100 Conservative MPs not publicly saying they would vote against it. That's why we have these calls, or at least rumours, uh, of suggestions that the vote could be delayed from Tuesday. Uh, though that, I have to say, seems unlikely. It would be a real sign of weakness from the Prime Minister to delay the vote. And there is little, actually, I think she could probably do in the interim period uh, between delaying it, having it again. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure that will happen. What have MPs been telling you today? Yeah, as you say, I've been speaking to a, a wide range of MPs today, those backing May's deal uh, and those who certainly are not. And I started off by asking uh, some of them uh, why uh, they were or how they were going to vote uh, on Tuesday. Let's have a look. Sadly, I've come to the conclusion that, that I won't be able to support the government in, in, the, in the division lobbies on Tuesday night. And it's for me, I'm a serial loyalist. I've been in Parliament for three and a half years. I've never rebelled against the government. To be honest with you, I'm still uh, considering the matter. Uh, these are grave issues that will live with us for many, many years uh, to come. And they require serious consideration, deliberation. I want Theresa May to lose heavily because I don't think anything else will convince her that she isn't going to get her own way and she seems to be de prepared to destroy everything around her in order to get her own way. But the slight problem is we've got a 585 page document, a draft treaty, and unless there's a substantial rewriting of that document, we're going to need uh, serious reassurance that so we can get oh. All right, Darren. Yeah, so interesting range of views there uh, from uh, MPs. Ultimately, what's going to happen on, on Tuesday? Well, as I say, by best estimates, Theresa May is going to lose uh, that vote. What happens next? Well, that really is uh, anyone's guess. There are suggestions she could well resign as Prime Minister, uh, Tessa, though people who know her best say that is unlikely. She's got a real sense of, of duty. Could she face a challenge from within the Conservative Party? Could those Brexiteers finally get their 48 letters in uh, to force that leadership challenge? Or could the government itself face a vote of no confidence uh, from the Labour uh, Party? All we do know is that she could go back to Brussels and ask for more. 
as there's an EU Council summit next Thursday and Friday. But again, uh, European sources telling me that they're unlikely to budge on this withdrawal agreement. So where it goes next? Well, as I say, it really is anyone's guess. Yeah, to be a fly on the wall in that building behind you, Darren. Thank you very much. Our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, there. Joining us now in the panel, we have a new guest, David Herzenhorn, the chief Brussels correspondent at Politico. And back with me is Swedish liberal MEP Jacinko Selimovic and Nina Schick, director of data and polling at Rasmussen Global. All right, David, I'll start with you. This, this new twist of a possibly a delayed vote, is that, is that a new twist in this Brexit drama? It's not a new twist, and there may be a delay, there may not be a delay. I think we may be thinking about this a little wrong, and mm -hmm. that is that this vote, if it goes down, is not necessarily as big a defeat for Theresa May as it will be a defeat mm -hmm. for the House of Commons, for the British Parliament in general, for the British um, government and society as a whole, which has never been able to get its act together on Brexit. I think what you'll find after this vote, if it goes the way we expect, is that people will realize Theresa May did her job. She reached a deal with the EU that would bring the UK safely out on withdrawal date. Any delay in this is not going to solve the problem, which is that mm. British society is divided roughly in thirds about what they want, and there's no fixing that. And so the minute the MPs vote no, they're going to be asked, well, what next? And what's next is two things that they've already said they don't want. So what do they want? They mm. haven't been able to answer that question, and it'll look just that same way right after this vote. I mean, even Politico was doing a, a list of what scenarios, you know, what, what could happen next. And you were both shaking your heads when there was a mention of a possible softening or Norway-style Norway uh, deal. So, OK, what is the most most likely scenario here? Well, I, I found this, I do agree with you, the day will not change anything, but I think I found this idea of renegotiating the deal quite strange, not to say mm. on the verge of being insane. They were ne negotiating two years and they got the deal, What is this is the deal, 27 countries in Great Britain, and now they want another two years to negotiate? And then what? Then they will have another say of, of saying no or yes or no. This is the deal that is, that is done. It has to be voted in a parliament. Probably it will be voted down. And then probably they will have to go to referendum with that to find, well, this, this is the question. Yeah. That's, that's up to them to decide. Right. But having idea of changing this deal after two years of negotiation is, is kind of so strange that's out, to me. What, what, what are you Nina? Do you think it will be a referendum? It's the most likely, if it, because it seems like it's going to get voted down. I don't think that a second referendum is the most okay. likely. It takes a long time to get to there. And I think mm. that if the deal is voted down and somehow with cosmetic changes, with, which I think are possible, although in terms of renegotiating substantially with the EU, I mean, you can forget about it. That's simply not on the table. I think if that deal somehow doesn't get through, then the most likely next scenario is actually no deal Brexit. So mm. crash out simply because of incompetence. I don't think necessarily that a second referendum, well, it certainly wouldn't be permissible under Theresa May's government. She mm. would not be prime minister uh, putting that on the ballot paper again. Uh, I, I still think that one way or another, this deal somehow getting through is the most likely option. Do you, do you agree? And where does there that are, There are okay. so many escape hatches to avoid right. a no-deal Brexit, which nobody wants, that I disagree with that. I don't think there's any way we come to a no-deal Brexit well, scenario because they will either withdraw the Article 50 trigger unilaterally, which the courts have now indicated they can do, or well, they will ask the UK, the EU for more time. But, you know, there's been a lot of comparison to the Troubled Asset Relief uh, Program mm -hmm. vote in the House. I was right. in Congress that day, and I don't think the markets have priced in the possibility of this plan no going deal. down. Right. And I think what you will see most immediately is MPs staring a plummeting stock market, a plummeting pound. When the British pound is taking a hit, when voters start asking them, what in the heck have you done? We may see another vote in the Commons before we see mm -hmm. any talk more of a second referendum, because they will have to confront the reality of what they've done, which is undo mm -hmm. these 20 months of negotiations. Mm -hmm. There is no better deal in, in the cards. If you think Michel Barnier has no sympathy now, and I think when he talks about politicians taking responsibility, he's not talking about Theresa May. He's right, talking so about, about the MPs. Right. But if you think he has no sympathy now, just wait until they vote it down. The EU will have no sympathy for the UK at that point. They will be out there on their own. So that's definitely off the table. And you were, you know, you're talking about voters and what, what they really feel. And now it's probably, probably a bit Brexited out uh, at the moment. Well, as politicians continue to debate Theresa May's withdrawal deal in Westminster, we decided to find out exactly what people in the UK are feeling less than four months to go until the Brexit deadline. Now, we sent Brian Carter from Brussels to communities along the English border. First, he spent some time in Wales, and today he's catching up with people on either side of the Scottish border. Carlisle in England, Gretna in, and Kirkpatrick Fleming on the Scottish side, and here is what he discovered. My trip across the United Kingdom's borders took me a few miles south of Scotland to the English city of Carlisle, 
where it's fair to say that the weather was a little less welcoming than the people. Curbing migration had been a powerful message in persuading people to vote leave. I wanted to see for myself the impact of Brexit on Britain's migrant communities. Polish mother of two, Paulina, has lived in Britain for 14 years and is concerned about the future. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I'm just, just worried, like everybody. So if you ask anyone from EU, everybody will give you the same answer. We pay taxes, we pay everything, so we are clear. So hope, hope so everything will be on good way. And the law, it will be like the same for every people, you know, so finger crossed. Paulina's customer, Asha, born in Scotland and raised by Polish parents, is also worried about what leaving the EU might mean for her community. They're worried about living here, but also a lot have gone back home. An awful lot have gone back home, which is good in one way, that they're going back to where their roots are. But on the other hand, I think, you know, they've given so much to this country as well. And they've got such a fantastic name, the Poles, regarding their work ethic. Their work ethic is amazing, um, which I'm so proud of that. It was time for me to leave Carlisle, hop on the northbound train and head across the border. So I'm now heading to Scotland, just going through the Lake District at the moment. And the reason for going to Scotland, obviously, is because in 2016, in the referendum, they overwhelmingly voted to remain in the EU. 62% of the people actually voted to remain. So I'm quite keen to go up there and talk to the Remainers and uh, see how they feel about Brexit and where they think the country is going next. I soon met 40-year-old Scottish Remainer Neil, who works in advertising and feels very disillusioned about the whole Brexit process. It's not looking good and it looks like there's going to be an objection to every stage. That's really frustrating for me because I'm at a point now where I'm not sure I really care about what the deal is going to be. I just want a deal because it's went on so long now. And from my point of view, it's, it's strangling the economy. Even in my line of work, we're noticing that brands or companies don't want to spend because everybody's trying to figure out what the future holds. Having finally arrived in Scotland, I wanted to speak to the rural communities where uncertainty over Brexit threatens jobs and livelihoods. My name's Graham Ray. I'm an agricultural contractor, first and foremost. Born and bred Kapati Fleming, South West Scotland. Graham, who's been in farming for nearly half a century, has a pretty straightforward opinion of the people running the country in Westminster. I've, I've had more common sense talked in a children's nursery, to be honest with you. I mean, they're just, it's just a nonsense when you see it. In, if, you, if you watch the programmes of, the, of, of Parliament, it, it's unbelievably childish the way they're behaving, all behaving. There's never going to be a Brexit deal that suits everybody. That's why the vote was, re was reasonably close. There's never going to be a deal that suits everybody, but we've, we've got to embrace it now and get on with it. Like most people I met in the UK, Graham thinks enough time has been wasted on the negotiations. The threat of a no Brexit and the threat of another two years of indecision and fighting, is, instead of running the country properly, is going to cause more bother than it's worth. I think we made the decision at the referendum, there's no need for another referendum. My journey ended back on the border between England and Scotland, two nations with a heavy past who have managed to bridge many of their differences. A common history commemorated by these man-made rock structures called cairns. Cairns like these are found all along the English-Scottish border. They are a testimony to the United Kingdom. But when it comes to Brexit, I found anything but unity. There is still a lot of uncertainty, fear and boredom about the whole divorce procedure. Whether or not these divisions can be overcome after Brexit, if Brexit happens, or if the problems here will be echoed across Europe remains to be seen. Brian Carter for Euronews at the English-Scottish border. I mean, as you were watching that, you know, I, was, I was asking uh, if whether, you know, Scotland will be, which overwhelmingly did, voted to remain, be trying to push for a vote of their own. So Nicola Sturgeon, obviously the leader of the SNP, is biding her political time very well at the start of the Brexit negotiations. You know, she started making overtures about independence again, but recently she's been very helpful to, to Theresa May. She's not being like the perennial thorn in Theresa May's style side like the DUP. And the reason why she's doing this, that 
is if the issue of Scottish independence ever comes on the table again, she can say she did everything to help Theresa May win those Brexit negotiations. It's a very canny political operator. I don't think Scottish independence, at least by her own wish, is off the table I mean, that's yet. That's really interesting. Political chess game there.